Hey, welcome back to The Urban Monk. I am live in studio. Yay, real people with Sylvia Terra, who is local as well. Um, and so welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. you. Are, uh, there's a book called The Secret Life of Fat. And so, and I'm really excited to talk about this because she went on a journey to discover what all this stuff is about with fat. And so um, you are a researcher by trade. Yeah. Give us a little bit of your sure. background. Sure. So yeah, I'm a scientist by training. I'm my PhD in biochemistry. I studied actually neurology and Alzheimer's degree as a graduate student. I then got an MBA and I went to the business side of biotechnology and, uh, and the business side of science. And I've been there for probably around 16, 17 years now. And I became very interested in fat just because I gain it actually quite easily. And uh, my fat acts a little bit differently than other people's do. I, I gain easier, it's a little softer. Uh, I don't get rid of it very easily. And I had this experience of going on diets where I would lose a few pounds, uh, not much more. Sometimes I could even gain weight on a diet. And uh, I got really tired of this. And I thought, I have to understand fat once and for all. I have to know why it's acting this way, why my fat acts differently. And I went on a five-year mission to research fat. I pulled a lot of scientific articles, about over a 1,000 research dozens of researchers around the world about what they were finding out about fat. And what I found out was so astounding that I decided I'm going to capture it all in the book and share it with everybody. Took five years. Yeah. You interviewed the who's who. The who's you who. went through all of PubMed. Yes. And um, and we talked about this offline when we'll be right before we got going. It's like there's so many of these like young 23 year old meatheads t t talking about like here's what you've got to do to lose weight. <laughs> it just doesn't apply to everybody. Right. So what have you found? What have I found? Why, the first thing to really know about fat is that fat's not just fat. It's not just sitting there. It's not just a reserve of calories. And you don't want to get rid of all of your fat. And this was the most surprising thing to me, is that fat is actually an endocrine organ, meaning that it makes hormones and it releases them into your bloodstream and it has a vast impact on a lot of different organs in your body. Uh, for example, fat affects your immune system. If you get too low of fat, uh, you're not as strong uh, with your immune system. Fat affects reproduction. Women with too low of a body fat actually can't conceive, they can't get pregnant. You can't even go through puberty if you don't have enough fat. Uh, our brains are linked to fat, brain size, brain weight. It's linked to how much fat we have. So through the hormones it emits, fat's having a great impact on our body. And because fat is so important, nature wants to protect it. So even though we don't value our fat, we want to get rid of our fat, uh, nature doesn't and our bodies don't. Mm -hmm. And fat has ways to fight back. And this is what people really need to know. It's actually a very clever organ inside of us. So through one hormone it makes leptin, Fat can affect our satiation or appetite, and it affects our metabolism. So when we have normal levels of fat, uh, our, we're pretty satiated overall, and our metabolism is strong. When you lose fat, you lose leptin. And with less leptin, your appetite really increases. Your metabolism goes lower. You get a preoccupation with food. And in that way, fat is fighting to come back. Nature is trying to protect fat, trying to keep it at the set point that we have. Mm. And so the effect doesn't really go away as far as people can tell. It's been studied for up to six years and people have that effect for six years. So anyone who's yo-yo dieted, lost some weight, they actually have to eat less, fewer calories than someone who's naturally at that weight to begin with because their metabolism is affected. Probably around 22% fewer calories than someone naturally at that weight to begin with. So really fighting obesity, fighting fat, it's a lifelong endeavor. Uh, losing it is not easy, and staying at that weight will take chronic effort. Well, yeah, and as witnessed by the gajillions of people who are dieting every day of their yeah. lives, it's, it's hard. Okay, so we have this thing called visceral fat, yeah. which is bad. I think we could all agree it's bad, yes? Yes, it's bad. So the fat that's underneath the stomach wall, nestled in next to your internal organs, uh, it tends to get very crowded, it gets inflamed, it sends out inflammatory signals, and that interferes with insulin and insulin signaling. And it's that type of fat that's really linked with cardiovascular disease and diabetes and a number of different health issues. Mm -hmm. uh, there's subcutaneous fat, that fat that's right under your skin, that is a healthier fat deposit away from your belly. Um, there's all kinds of other fat, there's brown fat, right, that's another type, and brown fat's very interesting. Instead of storing energy, it's burning energy. And so we have brown fat around our heart, around our neck, around our spine, and then there's a newly discovered beige fat that can turn brown. And it turns brown when exercise as a stimulator for that, and even cold exposure. And so we have fat all over. There's fat in our brain, uh, myelin, which I'm sure you know, which is, is wrapping you know, parts of our, our nerve cells to help signal conduction, primarily made of fat. So really fat is a, it's a critical component of your body, and there's different types. So too much of a good thing? 
Sounds like the uh, era that we're in. Um, so we have good fats. I, I was telling you uh, before we even started the show, I actually feel better wearing about five, 10 extra pounds. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was under 10% body fat, I was a little, just a little more anxious, a little bit more hungry all the time. I just wasn't as settled. And, you know, I just, I, I'm very at ease having a couple extra pounds on. And so, you know, it's, it's less sightly, I guess, but. I don't care because I could still beat guys up and down the basketball court. So, you know, at what point does it matter? At what point does it become pathology? At what point do you have to worry? I know, like for men, they say if your waist, waist goes past size 40, there's all yeah. these like, numbers people throw around. It's very different for everybody. And there's a case of sumo wrestlers that I write about in my book. And these are people who are three and 400 pounds. And uh, metabolically, they're healthy, believe it or not. And it's because they exercise seven to eight hours a day. Mm. And what that does really is that it increases, a, another hormone that fat releases is adiponectin. And when we exercise, actually fat will increase more adiponectin. And adiponectin, it's a, it's a guide for fat in your blood. It tells it to come home, come home to fat, and it helps clear your blood and put circulating fats in subcutaneous fat tissue. And so because of all the exercise they do, these sumo wrestlers are actually quite healthy. They don't have metabolic disease, at least. Because the fat in the bloodstream is yes. the real dangerous side of fat. Right? Yeah, and that's where if, if you let it roam around your blood, it's going to deposit in other places. It will deposit in your heart. It will deposit in your liver, places it's not really supposed to be. You want your fat to be in fat tissue. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there's some genes where people are predisposed to having more fat cells, and, and they thought they would be less healthy. But what they found, they're more healthy because their blood is very clear, and it's just a sign that their their bodies are clearing fats out of the blood, and they're putting them in sub cutaneous tissue. So, you know, it depends on where your fat is. If it's a lot of visceral fat, that's going to be more of a problem. But fat in, it, in itself is not necessarily a sign of health. You know, that being said, I don't, I'm not promoting obesity, you know, with my book. I think that that is an issue, not just for metabolic disease, but for your bones and the stress, you know, on, on your body. Uh, but I think 10 extra pounds, like, you know, you say you have, I think that's not necessarily a bad thing as long as your, your fat's in the right place. So that's the question is a, okay, where's fat in the right place? Yeah. How does one determine that? Like, yeah. do, you, do you like, uh, you know, do I go to my doctor and say, hey, what's my visceral fat versus my, my straight fat? Like, how do, I, how do I know this? So one way to test for visceral fat is you lie on your back and you look at your belly. And when you're lying down, if your belly's still protruding like this, that's probably visceral fat hmm. under your stomach wall. If it flattens when you lie down, then you probably got subcutaneous fat there and it's not as bad. And so that's mm -hmm. one way to test for visceral fat. Uh, you, know, you can see where it is too on your profile. If it's more in your, your hips, your thighs, your buttocks, it's safer deposit to have. You mm -hmm. might still want to reduce it just for the way you look and, and how you feel about how you look. And, and those are different issues than where is it really dangerous fat for your mm -hmm. body or not. Yeah. Okay, so if it's dangerous, it's dangerous, then you got to do something. But, you know, as we mentioned earlier, for you, weight loss is very different than it is for me, which is very different for, say, Sean or Laura. Every, everyone in this room has a different kind of set point. Right. Right. Age, genetics, all of it. Yeah. So how does one look at weight loss given this milieu, right? Yeah, well, I think it's a number of things. Any diet, anything you do, it has to work for you biologically. You have to, your body has to feel good with it. It has to work for whatever biological profile you are. It has to work for you psychologically. There might be things you, you want to eat or refuse to eat, and they can't be in your diet profile. And it has to work for your lifestyle. Some of these very complicated diets where it's special ingredients, you have to shop, you have to prepare, it's not going to work for someone who's busy. All those things really have to come together for you. And depending on where you are uh, in your life and with your body, uh, you know, if you're middle age, you're going to diet very differently than someone who's 22 and has tons of testosterone and growth hormone that's burning up fat all the time. So figuring out where on the spectrum you are, it, there's a number of things. One is, how is your health? Do you have metabolic disease? Do you have to get rid of some fat, get rid of dietary fat, and make sure you exercise so that's deposited in the right place? What size do you really need to fit in? Part, into part of it's just being realistic about the goal. Do you really have to look like you did at 22? Do you really have to look like a bikini model or, or an athlete? And just being realistic about where, where it is you belong. And I think that will help too. I do think the diet industry gives us unrealistic goals mm. and unrealistic promises. You know, you've heard so much about eat this and lose 10 pounds, do this and lose you know another 20 pounds. And if you do, you'll look like this. And they put mm -hmm. this up. It is a great way to sell diet books. It's something everybody wants and is led to believe they should have. But in truth, your lifestyle, your level of fat, and your diet have to work for you in so many ways. And like we said, you can be 10 pounds, 15 pounds over, and it might not be the end of the world for you. Your overall health markers are fine. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's talk about resting versus active metabolic rate. Okay. I'm sure you've seen plenty of research on that. Um, 
if your RMR drops and it's lower, you're yeah. not metabolizing as well. If your VO2 max doesn't get there. So I'd love for you to just kind of tease this out a little bit because this is where the ex-phys guys really hang their hats, right? Is just getting into that fat burning zone, living there and just kind of staying there to maximize the fat burning. Yeah, you can, and again, it depends on how much fat you want. If you're really a bodybuilder, you're, you're performing, you want very low fat, all those things are going to be important for you. To be honest, I don't go into that level of detail when I diet. Um, what I have learned and I really like is uh, you know, intermittent fasting I find works really well. That's a way to extend the growth hormone release and burn fat. Um, it also uh, um, releases, uh, sorry, I'm, testosterone and other things that you get you know, for overnight. And exercise is a very good way to do it as well. So um, hit high, high uh, intensity interval. Thank you for that, yeah. yeah. So that, that's another one where you can burn a lot of calories really in a short time. And, and certain exercises, uh, like strength building exercises, actually release growth, growth hormone and testosterone and help you burn some fat. Long uh, or bouts of aerobic exercise will help as well to release growth hormone. So I'm actually not as, as technical on it as that. I don't feel like I, I have to be, but I think if you're really competing and you want 8% body fat or, or something like that, then yeah, you would want to go into that level of granularity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's different math. Yeah. So um, we mentioned HIT, we mentioned intermittent fasting. I mean, these things have become very vogue, Yeah. right? And I know people that are, um, they have very challenged adrenal profiles that are water fasting and their blood sugar is not that stable. And so, you know, at some point it starts to be a law of diminishing returns. It's mm -hmm. like you're trying to minimize calories, but you're elevating cortisol. So let's talk about cortisol and what it does. Okay, so cortisol is a stress hormone and uh, having too much of it is linked with visceral fat. You have more fat, um, you know, it gets in the way of other hormones as well, which is an issue. You know, it, a lot of things we do in our life release cortisol, driving in traffic releases cortisol. So I don't know if it's realistic to say I'm gonna to try to really minimize cortisol. We have mm -hmm. stress in our life. But you know, what you said about fasting and being right for people, again, that's where the, the psychological and, and does this diet work for you socially and for your, for your life work as well. It works for me and that's because I don't like to be so careful about what I have to eat. I'm not gonna be someone who uh, eats only 20 ingredients and won't eat anything else. I find with intermittent fasting, I can more or less eat what I want around lunchtime, maybe a snack at three, and as long as I don't eat, I, I don't accumulate that. So uh, if it stresses you out though, and you're talking to other trainers who advocate intermittent fasting, they say the same things. I mean, don't do it. If this isn't right for you, don't do it. And there's a lot of other ways you can diet and eat that hopefully don't produce that kind of stress. So you know, another method is you take smaller meals during the day. If that works for you, that's fine. You know, I, I work and I'm busy, that doesn't really work for me. I like to eat be done, but that's another way to, uh, to spread it out. You can mm -hmm. do fasting at different times a day, skip your morning, skip into lunch, and eat, eat at night if you need to. So I, I think the diet has to work in all dimensions, and if one is causing stress, it's too hard to be on. Clearly, it's not gonna work for the long term. That's it, and, and, and that's usually where we're at, is people will diet, get to a goal or yeah. not, and then be like, look at me, here's my selfie, and then go back to life as normal because you can't live that way. Yeah. So it's unsustainable. And so, you know, it's like, oh man, remember back in 2002, I looked so damn good. Yeah. Well, what good does that do if you can't live there? So let's talk about some sensible approaches. Yeah. Caloric restriction, yeah. how much calorie counting is necessary? Yeah, that's a good question, especially with all the talk about fat and the satiation factor of fat. And so that was always given a lot of calories on the calorie count, but it's not so bad to eat it anymore. So I think, again, it depends on, on your body type. Uh, it's hard to say for anyone. I know for me, you know, I, I do a very low calorie type of diet, so it's usually around 1,200 calories or lower, and that seems to work for me. And, and I think the way to take it is you do your own analysis, treat it like you are a scientist. You have a, you have a spreadsheet, this is what I do. I have a spreadsheet, I, eat what I, I, I write down what I eat and when, uh, about how many calories, and I, I have an idea of the protein and carbohydrate content. And I use that over time to hone that and I could notice what was making me gain or making me retain weight versus when I could lose weight. And I did this for months at a time. And this is how I honed in onto fasting really works because I could see when I ate later in the day after six or seven, I didn't lose weight and I would gain weight. I also noticed there's some things I can eat and it doesn't bother me, I don't gain weight. It's supposed to make me gain weight, I can eat chocolate surprisingly enough and I actually don't gain weight off chocolate. I could have a cookie and I will gain a pound and a half the next day. And hmm. so these things, it's very different for everybody. In fact, there's very good research that came out of Israel um, at the Weizmann Institute where Aaron Segal did the study where he had people eat various foods. He would test their blood for a, a blood sugar spike. 
And he noticed some people could eat a muffin, some people have, have liquor, and they were fine. There's no blood sugar spike. Other people couldn't do that. Their mm -hmm. bodies would react. So that's where the individualization of a diet is really important. And so what worked for me, I could give people you know, my formula, but I'm hoping not everyone has to do it as hard as I do, has to be as restrictive as I do. Um, and I think you just have to hone it. What diet works for you? The more you know about what's in the secret life of fat, what I'm hoping it allows people to do is tailor a diet plan for what works for them. So if there's a certain diet you like, but you're not losing weight, the knowledge that's in this book hopefully helps you figure out why that might be, why you're gaining more, where you are in your life, and what things you can do to ratchet back mm -hmm. and make that diet work. And oftentimes it's to do with you know carbohydrates, it's to do with sugar, it's to do with the time of day that you eat, and just how much you're eating in general. Which means you have to kind of step in and be accountable for your own life. And so, it, yeah. and the challenge with most of these diets is, Tell me what to do. Yeah. Just tell me what to do. Oh, that worked or it didn't work. Yeah. Um, I'm a winner or a loser. And it's just, it's a very binary system and it's, and it's very disempowering. Right. So you're actually asking people to think, how dare you, you know? <laughs> it's, yes. Oh my goodness. So when I hear this, I know that there are a lot of, so you're saying, okay, so bringing up growth hormone, bringing up testosterone are also ways to bring yeah. up metabolic rate burn more fat, make you more efficient. Right. And so immediately then what I hear is, you know, especially where we live, all these Newport Beach doctors that are like, I got testosterone, uh, yes, yes. right? It's like, don't worry about it. Yeah. I have this injectable that's yeah. going, so let's talk about what that does to the cells and what that does to us then having to be dependent on external testosterone, you know, yeah. supplementation. Yeah, the well, first thing I'll say about that is that it's a viable, source, right? If we're, gonna use, if we're gonna use diet pills and we're gonna do bariatric surgery, well then hormones are just another way of medical intervention around your weight. Sure. Um, it does work, and in fact, I write a couple profiles of people who've taken it and the results they have, it's pretty good. It is not sustainable for the long run because after a while the risk benefit profile doesn't really work. They start to have some health you know, risk as you go on with age and you still take those. So there's also ways to do it naturally and that's what I opted for. And living in Southern California, I'm always tempted to walk in and get a dose of growth hormone or some such thing and not have to worry every, about it. Yeah, the nail spa, spa has it. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's that's everywhere. right. But really, I, I chose for some pretty harsh exercise and I feel it. I feel different. If I do strength uh, type of exercise, strength building exercise three times a week, my energy is really high, right? Libido is even higher. And, and the things, I can feel that there's a difference in my mm -hmm. hormone profile. So it's expensive to use hormones in that way. If you go to a clinic, uh, there are some, some risks to doing it. Mm -hmm. So there are ways to naturally do it. But I think if people, if they get to a stage where they're overweight, it's really hard, and they want a medical intervention, there's, there's all kinds of things you can do, and, and hormones are one type of those things. So the elephant in the room, is stress because yeah. I know people that will go get testosterone and still aromatize and have higher estrogen, higher DHT, and not really be reaping the benefits there. Yeah. Uh, stress is really hard to not have in a conversation around weight. What, what did you find with cortisol? What did you find with stress? Yeah, so stress, you know, like I said, I don't know that we avoid stress in our lives. I mean, if you're raising kids or you have a job or you're paying your bills, whatever it is, we have stress. I think stress does really factor into our self-control and willpower, and I do write about that. That managing stress, people who have, who have chronic stress, they tend to eat more and they have less self-control. They have, they have, are do they do not manage stress as well when you have an overwhelming amount? In fact, there was an, an article in the New York Times where candy sales went really high around the recession. In fact, every company was losing money except for candy companies mm -hmm. they were actually selling. So people <clears throat> want to give in to stress. Um, you know, clearly, if you can reduce some stresses in your life or even learn to manage stress better that's gonna help you through. You know, I know even, even though I'm careful, if I really have a deadline, if I'm going up against something where I'm high stress, I'm not as careful those times as I am in other times. Mm -hmm. uh, the other way to do it is if your stress goes up and down is that you might give in while you're around a lot of stress. Um, you know, just get back on it right afterward. And, and this is one thing successful dieters do very, very well is that they tend to not go off their diet much ever, not on holidays or ever. And I have a tip in there for the, the five tips of successful dieters, but that's one really strong component. They have really strong willpower. It becomes habit. And that's another thing you can do. The more you ingrain something, the more you do it every day, it becomes non-stressful. It's now a habit and you're not thinking mm -hmm. about it as much. So it's hard at the beginning. Um, but the, the chapter on willpower, I think, will help because there's ways to make stress less. One is temptation bundling, where if something is hard to do, you pair it with an activity that's really fun to do. 
And uh, people going to the gym, they had them go to the gym a number of times, and they were allowed to have you know a, a novel of their choice, an audio book of their choice. And other people, uh, they were allowed to go freely, one group, and one group it was restricted. They could only have that novel if they worked out. And the group that had, could only have it when they worked out, they actually lost more weight, they stayed at the gym more, and they actually opted to continue doing it afterward. Like it was mm. that much of a, a lure for them to do this. So you try that, try pairing good with bad. Give yourself a break. Chronic stress is much harder. If you actually put in fun, engineer fun into your life and release a little stress, that'll help mm -hmm. you with the ebbs and, and peaks and, and just help you get a break from constant stress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about, um, there's a lot of new information coming out, um, a lot of old information coming new um, around using heat, um, like hormesis and things that are kind of stimulators. They get the body to kind of react and get into, uh, you know, kind of a, a safe crisis mode. And hmm. then, uh, you know, I, I don't know if that was in the fat literature, if you looked at any of that. I have it. What I did look at is cold exposure, mm -hmm. right? So which is a hormetic stressor as well. Okay. Yeah. yeah, which is producing brown fat, then getting your brown fat active, and it's actually turning some beige fat into brown as well. Mm -hmm. And so, th so that's one of the things that's used. In fact, there's all kinds of fun things going on with brown fat now, even injecting brown fat into white fat to try to get it to take and burn mm -hmm. more calories. So yeah, some, some of that I looked at, and I mm -hmm. think those are interesting and probably work and maybe even replace exercise at some point if you just get enough of those, mm -hmm. those stressors and get your fat to get active. Mm -hmm. yeah. How much of it is sedentary lifestyle? I mean, it's hard. We're sitting right now. You know, yeah. it's, it's hard to not sit in the world we're in. Like, I'm on a plane tomorrow morning. Yeah. I can't walk around. Yeah. No, that's a big factor for your health overall. And there's yep. so many benefits to exercise. It's not just the amount of fat you have. It's how much brown fat you get, how much lean muscle and, and lean, lean mass that you get, you know, as fat, in addition to the hormones that, that exercise produces. It's probably something that ages us as being very sedentary because you know we have hormone decline naturally with age, and then even more so because we're not moving. Right. And so we have an unnatural life. It's certainly not the way it was intended to be. We were probably supposed to be walking around and exercising more, but it means you have to be more disciplined about putting exercise in. Even after I get off a plane, I will go to the, the hotel gym and I'll mm -hmm. work out. And so we have this artificial life where we're sedentary for 12 hours, and then we have a really, really active space for one hour or an hour and a half while you work out. And, you just have to engineer that in. It's the life we have, and it's, it's not going to change. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, yeah. it's really hard to change. I know right. people that like move to Montana, but yeah. not everyone could get to do that. Montana right. doesn't want everyone. Right? <laughs> and, and, and that's also a big piece of it. Yeah. Um, you know, I do a lot of travel. Um, I try to stay as active as I can, the hotel rooms and all that. Um, you just take a hit by slowing down your metabolism. You take yeah. a hit by not having access to the foods. I mean, you can get a salad most places nowadays, but right. you know, what have you found? Uh, for successful dieters that has been, you know, a, a, a habit that has been kind of consistent across the board with busy people. Yeah, so I think what busy people do, I, the, the fasting approach actually works quite well. I know a lot of people who do that. They'll just not eat very much during the day and they'll go home and have a dinner, you know, with their spouse or something like that. But you know, for really busy people, uh, it is putting in exercise, having a routine as much as you can. And it gets disrupted all the time because we travel and we have deadlines and presentations and things like that. But every one of them I know, they, they fit in at least three times a week, they'll do an hour of exercise that keeps them quite active. They're very good about staying away from too high of carbs. They're educated. They're more educated about fat and their body and the foods that they're eating, and that seems to work. You know, some of them, they just are more attentive to it. So when they see their weight creeping up, you know, they'll quickly pull it back you know, mm -hmm. into order. Um, for a lot of people, it gets to a point where they see a picture of themselves. There's a trigger that causes them to be really serious about their weight. They either see a picture and they look very heavy, heavier than they ever have in their life. There might be a diagnosis, something like that happens, or they just get to a point where they don't want that. And it, to me, that, that happened more or less. There were just clothes hanging in my closet. They were a smaller size than I was at the moment. And I thought, this is a now or never moment. They're either going to fit me again, or I'm going to throw them away. They gotta go, right. They gotta go, and you know, life's not forever. And I have to make mm -hmm. a decision about where, how in control do I wanna be? Do I want these to fit? And so it, it was a similar moment of, I'm gonna get back into control. I, I want those to fit, and mm -hmm. that's the life I want to have. And so it's a kind of control over your life, feeling empowered to take on your fat. And when you feel that and it becomes important to you, you have a whole different motivation in your life. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of controversy over food companies and are they acting responsibly with the, the groceries we see in the, in the grocery store. And I have a little bit of a different take on that. I think once you have the motivation to lose weight, you'll go into the same grocery store and you'll pick the foods that help you lose weight mm -hmm. and stay in shape. The Cheerios and tricks are always going to be there. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you go to Whole Foods, right, the, the kind of holy grail of healthy food and- Well, there's, it's <laughs> filled with junk food. You could get fat at Whole Foods. So the food's oh, yeah. always oh. gonna be there. Gluten-free fat. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. And so you, it has to start with the motivation. You have to have a strong desire uh, to keep the weight off. And mm -hmm. most people I know who stay that way, they, they do. Either for they want to look a certain way, they want to be healthy, they have good control mm -hmm. on their behavior, and they can make decisions on the food they're going to eat. And I think that's really the key for people who are busy, you know, professionals or whatever your story is. That's the way you really stay on. You have to have the motivation first. The old story of the thirsty man who starts to dig a well and then doesn't hit any water, so then starts over here and starts over here. That's what I feel like a lot of these diet plans do as well, yeah. is people don't give them enough time to become a habit, to become a lifestyle. Right. So it's like, you know, the, the clickbait marketer said that if I, you know, do this crap, I'll lose 10 pounds in 10 days. Yeah. And here I am, I'm only down three pounds, forget about it. So yeah. how much consistency and just kind of staying, staying the road and understanding that it's a long game um, yeah. is important in this. That is really an important point. And that's a lot of what I write about in Secret Life of Fat. In fact, the Secret Life of Fat is best as a companion to a diet than it is a diet book onto itself. It's mm -hmm. like first understand your fat, now try a diet and you'll un hopefully understand why it is or is not not working for you. Mm. Because what you just said about it, you might lose weight slower. That's the story of my life. I always lose weight slower. It takes me mm. a lot longer to lose it. Um, it's because of where I am, right? It's because of my genetics to some extent. Uh, it is probably because of a microbiome issue and it's because of age and the hormone level that I'm at. I'm not going to lose weight like a 25 year old is going mm -hmm. to lose weight. And so again, having realistic expectations, where are you in life biologically, right? You, there might be reasons you are losing slower than somebody else. You'll, a woman will never lose as much weight as a man. Testosterone is a major fat burner. Uh, one great study where they had people, men who exercised uh, three times a week and those who didn't, but they took testosterone supplements. The ones who took testosterone supplements had lost more weight and gained more muscle mass than the ones who were exercising. Unfair. So hands down, you guys are gonna lose weight more. All those different components have to come in. When you start a diet, understand your fat, understand the body, understand the ways we're getting fat, and that will help you stay on a diet. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it helps you after a few months if that's not working, understand why not and why it might not be a good diet for you. What, what I have learned from talking to dieters and talking to, to some physicians too is that uh, it's harder. I mean, some people have to take very drastic measures and it's so much of the diet literature tells you that you're not supposed to have to do that. This is supposed to be easy. You're supposed to be full mm -hmm. all the time. And if you're not, you're doing something wrong. You're not following the plan right. The truth is not everyone can do that. Some people have to be hungry. Some people have to really restrict longer. They have to exercise more. Uh, luckily, we do we do reset after a while. So if you're able to stay on that for, for some months, it does get easier with time. The habits form, your body gets used to it. But these one size fit all diets, they just, they don't work. It makes for a great selling of diet books. It's an easy message. You can get mm -hmm. it out there. You're making these promises. People want something easy. Um, but it doesn't do a lot for really solving obesity and overweight. And we see that. We spend $60 billion a year in the U.S. On, on trying to fight fat, and we're not really winning. And it's because a lot of these, these easy tricks just don't really work. Oh, it's a great business. Yeah. Arms dealers need wars, right? <laughs> and so, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a really, that's the dark side of the health industry. Yeah. The other dark side is almost every health guru I know, not almost, but a lot of them, like male and female, they're all taking testosterone, right? Do my diet and look like me. Come yeah, on, right? that's right. So, so there's a lot of that kind of dirty laundry that yeah. people aren't talking about. Is yeah. that they're on hormone replacement and then you know, they got to stay on it and they got all the problems and the fallout. It's, it's really, it's not, it's not pretty. So you know, yeah. what we want to do is just bring on this conversation for yeah. normal people who are tired of the crap. Yeah. Right? Uh, there's a lot of talk about obesogens um, and so the endocrine disrupting yeah. hormone uh, compounds that are found in you know, household cleaning products XYZ. Yeah. What'd you find? That's a great story. And I do cover that in The Secret Life of Fat. So obesogens, especially xenoestrogens, they, they mimic estrogen in a way. And when we get too much of that, uh, our body produces a protein called sex hormone blinding globulin. And that clears out the xenoestrogens. Problem is it also clears out testosterone too. And so we have less testosterone, we are burning less fat, and we get heavy. I tell a great story of a, a man named Jerry who he was this thrill seeker, thrill seeker uh, athlete. And he used to jump out of helicopters and, and just have this great, exciting life. He came into the, a doctor's office and he was just feeling down. He had gained weight. Even though he ramped up his exercise, he was gaining some weight. And through a series of tests, uh, the doctor noticed that he had xenoestrogens in his blood and they had to go through his life, a whole life questionnaire. He had recently gotten married and his wife was cooking hot food and putting it into plastic containers. And plastic has some of these xenoestrogens and obesogens in it. 
And then he was taking it and microwaving it in the container the next day. So he was getting a lot of BPA and different things uh, in his blood that was affecting his metabolism. He changed the glass containers and he started feeling better. He started losing weight again. He was able to go out bungee jumping and do all the things that he does. So in large amounts, they can have an effect. And you know, it's in uh, cosmetics, some of the parabens, uh, the mm -hmm. preservatives in there, certain plants, uh, plastics, pesticides, all of these have that in. And so you do have to be careful about uh, how you're making your food, how you're treating it, and what, mm -hmm. what you're eating. But it, it's pretty interesting. So, but so here, here's what I'm hearing right now, and this is what people um, in our live audience and people who are listening are yeah. going to be hearing uh, selectively, is, oh, Xenoestrogens, I'm gonna swap out my Tupperware and then all of a sudden all my problems go away. It's like, no, you probably still need to exercise. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? It's, yeah. it's like, oh, there's, there's the one thing yeah. and it's it's kind of the everything is yeah. what I'm hearing. It's like, you have to have a comprehensive approach. You have to, you have to think of all different components of what's making you gain weight, especially as you get older because there'll be more of them in your life as you get older. Stress, we talked about a lot. We've talked about hormones. We've talked about just how life changes. And that's what's different about The Secret Life of Fat. A lot of these books are very one-dimensional. It's, it's so much as low carb, right? If you haven't mm -hmm. learned by now, low co you know, carb is, is something that actually makes you gain weight through insulin, then that's kind of an old story. Mm -hmm. There's so much more to it than that. Mm -hmm. And this is very comprehensive. It takes on not only insulin, but it takes on the different hormones. It takes on the bacteria that we're getting, even viruses we're getting, the genetics of fat, and just how fat behaves in itself, what fat is in our body. And it's not just sitting there. It's not just this empty reserve of calories. It's doing things. It's active. It's metabolic. It has hormones. It, it knows how to fight for its survival. It knows how to control our thoughts about food even through leptin. Uh, it is clearing our blood of adiponectin, uh, sorry, clearing it of fats through adiponectin. And so it's, it's very complicated. It's very sophisticated. There's other ways we get fat. Think of all of these things if a diet's not working for you, if you have stubborn fat, if you're just feeling frustrated that you've tried a bunch of things and they're not working. There's, once you know all this though, there's not a substitute for the work. Mm -hmm. Right, you still you have to watch what you Sorry. eat. Sorry, yeah, <laughs> you have to. But but at least you'll know why things aren't working, and you can ratchet up or down depending on what it is you're finding out. You mentioned a couple of things that I think um, are just starting to surface, or at least in the popular literature, starting to surface. It's the role of bacteria and virus. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, let's get a little bit of that. All right. So we're surrounded by bacteria. From the time we are born, we start getting bacteria on our skin, in our gut, in any kind of opening that we have in our body. And so they have a function. We actually have more bacterial cells than human cells in our body. So we're, we're more bacteria than we are human in some way. Uh, they have a, it's a symbiotic relationship. So in our gut, they actually help us extract calories out of food. They help us digest things that we normally could not. And depending on the microbiome you have, you might be getting more calories out of your food versus less. So a bowl of cereal might say 100 calories for the bowl, but depending on what you've got in your gut, you could be getting 120 or you could be getting 80 calories mm -hmm. out of that. Um, the good news is that it can change. It's not static. So when we eat different things, if we eat a lot of fats and carbohydrates, we have one type of microbiome, which means a collection of bacteria in our gut. If we start eating a lot more fruits and vegetables and, and fiber, we have a different kind of microbiome. Mm. And it's that microbiome that's with fruits and vegetables and back, uh, that, that actually is more of a leaner profile of, of microbiome. So it's associated with more, more leanness. And we can, so we can change it. So it's almost like fat begets fat. It's like the more, you, uh, the high calorie fats that you eat, the more your microbiome extracts all that out mm. and puts fat on you um, versus when you're eating more fibrous foods that are hard to digest. Even bacteria can't necessarily get at it and extract those calories. And that tilts towards a more lean kind of profile of uh, microbiome in your gut. But if you, okay, so, so if you start to shift the math and you start getting more you know, fruits and vegetables in your yeah. diet, you start gaming towards more of those bacteria, yeah. then when you eat fat, are those bacteria uh, as efficient at breaking down that fat, so they help with the fat absorption as well, or are they just like, hey, we're we're on this side of the fence, we don't know what to do with you? We have a spectrum of bacteria. Right. You never just have one. In fact, the more diversity you have, that's also associated with leanness, a, a greater diversity of bacteria. And so you'll always have the ones that can do fat, but as you get more fibers, those ones that like fiber and deal with fiber, they're going to grow. And those mm -hmm. types of bacteria are associated more with the, with the lean profile, lean body type. Uh, but viruses are another interesting thing, and I touch on this, is that, I think this really worries people because viruses are harder to control, but viruses associated with fat have been known about for a long time. So in mice, canine distemper virus caused fat, and that's been known about since the 80s, and, and rouse-associated uh, virus causes fat in chicken. Um, they found one that causes it, that, that seems to be correlated with humans as well, it's AD36. And what they find is people who have ever had this virus have a three or four-fold greater 
uh, risk of obesity than people who haven't had it. And so this virus, the way it works is it actually produces more fat molecules and it produces more fat cells. And I actually profiled somebody who had this virus. Uh, he tested positive for having carried it, struggled with his weight a lot. And he's one of the people, is a little bit like me, he can't really eat very much. He calls himself not part of the eating world. He has to really restrict uh, his calories. He has to exercise a lot more than most people around him. And he's like a six foot one guy, right, who, can, who has to run and, and do a lot of things. So, so the little critters that we are all over the world, we, we accumulate them. Um, they come onto us and they affect how we metabolize food. They affect what we do with fat when it comes in or how much fat we even create. And all of these things you have to know about to understand why you might be getting more or less fat than somebody else. Yeah, well, and the plot thickens, right? And then we yeah. had a question that Sean's been waiting on from our audience, go ahead. So I have one from Weston. Um, he says, what was the most surprising case study from all of your research that you did? Yeah, that's a good one. I think it probably was that the Randy character with the virus, that was a really interesting one. So uh, he had gotten scratched, so, 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 the, the story is that the man who started to really lose the 80-36 and what it does to the body was actually from India, and he noticed this in chickens, that chickens were getting really fat after they got this virus called SMAM1 in India. And he, got, he was an obesity doctor, and he got so, so interested in this, he decided to quit uh, his practice and just research this full on. And he decided to come to America, because to, that's where really the research was happening at the time. And uh, he, was, he started looking for the SMAM virus. They didn't have it in America. He got the 8036 virus. It seemed to do the same thing. And through a lot of obstacles, he was able to, to get the virus, research it. And uh, during this time he's researching it, there's this man, Randy, who's struggling with this fat the whole time. He had grown up in the Midwest, and he had gotten scratched by a rooster when he lived in a farm. And about around that time, he started noticing he was really hungry all the time, and that he was getting more weight than he did in the past. And they had these parallel lives for a while, with one doing the research on the virus, and another one getting fatter and fatter, and not knowing what to do. And they finally intersect, because one of his doctors, Randy's doctors, learns about this research going on at University of uh, Wisconsin and sends Randy to, to this doctor whose name is Nikhil Durander. And they finally test him and they find he's positive for this virus. Hmm. And uh, after he learns this, life starts to make sense to Randy. He's like, this is why, this is why I gain weight. Damn you know, rooster. I, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, you know it, it's not just me, I'm not just this loser. Like there, there's reasons for this. Mm -hmm. He learns about set points, he learns about all the biology around fat and it empowers him. And he finally realizes what he has to do, that he has to just exercise in droves and he has to eat a lot less than other people. And he gets his life under control in a way, but, but he understands that you know, this is a change that happened in his life and this is probably the reason why he's got such a higher risk of obesity and he's just got to work at it much harder than anyone else. And this isn't a virus that you can just annihilate. It's, it's something that kind of stays with you, so there's yeah. no cure for this virus. That's right. I mean, there could be a vaccine in the future to prevent it, but the people who have it, uh, yeah, carry it. Yeah, yeah, they carry it. And it, it's yeah. not, it might not be that rare. I think there was one study done with 1,500 people, and they found that around 20% were positive for having carried the virus. Are these people who have probably a history of, say, rural, agricultural, um, you know, life, or is it not necessarily just not necessarily? Chickens? In fact, the transmission from chickens to humans is not completely known. It's not totally studied yet. So whether Randy got that from the rooster or not, it's, it's not completely verified. These people it was actually done in the Air Force. It was a study in the Air Force uh, personnel. They took 1,500 people. Uh, they tested them for the virus and they followed them for 10 years. And over the 10 years, the people who had tested positive gained more weight than the mm. people who weren't by about three or fourfold. And so it, it does have an effect, you know, on your on your life and your your um, the ease with what you which you gain mm. weight. Yeah. Uh, how do you test for the virus? Is it common? No, <laughs> it's not. Say. It's actually a, it's not a, a commercially available test. Uh, I think uh, Richard Atkinson, one of the doctors that I write about, has this test, but you have to. It's cumbersome. You have to give them a blood sample. They'll test it and send it back. But it's not widely available mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. And if you do have it, then the same kind of general uh, immunology hygiene that applies to anything applies, which is do things that keep your immune system healthy so yeah. that the viral load is controlled and all that, but at the end of the day, you got it. You yeah, got it. yeah, and it, it's not completely known how it's, how it's uh, transmitting. So, you know, can you get sneezed on and get fat? No one really knows. Right. Is it like getting a cold? Um, and it's not the end of the world, so I don't want to scare people from mm -hmm. thinking, oh my goodness, I might get obesity from a virus. If you have it, you just you work a little bit harder, that's mm -hmm. all. And you have to be aware that you have it, be careful. One of the most important things I learned in the book, as I wrote the book as well, is that um, 
not, you know, getting fat is much harder than never being fat, right? I mean, one is that you you once you lose fat, your metabolism's lower, you seek food more, you're eating about 22% fewer calories than, than before that. In a way, it's like cancer. Like once you have a tumor, you got to throw a lot of things at it to get over, to go away. It's always wanting to come back. And so even if someone tested positive for a virus, it means really don't gain weight. Like be very careful, watch it all the time. Once you gain it, you know, coming back is much harder than just never having had it to begin with. Yeah. yeah. Anyone, anyone who's gained weight can, can be a, you know, pay testament to that. Like, yeah. You know, after your 20s, all bets are off. It's, it's way harder to lose the weight. So it's, you know, much easier to avoid right. gaining it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. I, I love this conversation. I think that it's a sensible, refreshing one, yeah. and it's not like you're in here, you know, kind of snapping your suspenders, saying, "I figured out my super diet and just follow my thing." It's, yeah. hey, you got to think about it. You got to yeah. know what's up, and you have to rationally understand what your, you know, odds are against whatever. Yeah. And then you have a, a tool to then go into whatever dieting regime that you, you know, you need for you. That's so, right. yeah. I really appreciate that. Great. That's great perspective. The book Thanks. is called "The Secret Life of Fat." Um, and uh, you're a PhD, Dr. Sylvia Terra, who um, lives locally here. And I think, you know, this is, this is the kind of research that needs to be done. It's just kind of like that nonpartisan, I'm looking at this for myself, not some, some company right. getting me to research their stuff. So, right. yeah, yeah, no, it's very comprehensive. I hope people get a lot out of it. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. This has been great. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Let me know what you think in the chat threads, and uh, I will see you next time. Check me out at theurbanmonk.com. Let me know, wherever you're listening, give me some comments.